Statistics from 2018 through to 2019 show that more than 3,000 women died from cancer of the cervix. Now this translates to nine women dying daily, making it the leading cause of cancer mortality in Kenya. We are at the Nairobi Hospital to find out more. Come with me. Cancer of the cervix is uh, actually the most significant killer of women uh, as far as cancers of the reproductive tract go. And uh, in 2018, we had over half a million new cases diagnosed and we had uh, quite a number of deaths, over 30,000 of them. And in Kenya, we had uh, 5,000 plus new cases and over 3,000 deaths that occurred within that time frame. Since uh, 2020 began, uh, it may be difficult to have an exact figure of exactly how many people have developed as new cases of cancer of the cervix because uh, the upsurge of COVID-19 has significantly affected what we call health-seeking behavior, which is the tendency to go to the hospital to look for treatment. And uh, of course, if uh, you're coming to the hospital less, then, and that cuts across the board, then it means that uh, somebody is developing symptoms and they're only coming to the hospital when they are dying or uh, close to death. So when a patient develops cancer of the cervix, the common symptoms that they tend to have include pain in the pelvic region. So they'll have pain that's there and doesn't go away. It doesn't tend to be relieved by painkillers and it's pain that tends to go getting worse and worse as time progresses. The other thing that will make them go to the hospital is when they start bleeding outside of the time that is expected to be within their menses. And the other common symptom is what you call contact bleeding. That is bleeding when a person has sex. So you find that a woman goes, she has sexual intercourse with her husband or with her partner and after the intercourse, she finds herself bleeding for a day, two days, three days. She's in pain and uh, the bleeding is also happening other times, whether she's had sex or not, outside of her periods. As, as the, the cancer advances, the other common systems that tend to get involved will be the, the urinary system. So you find that as the tumor progresses, it can block the ureters. So you start getting kidney damage and you start getting kidney failure. So the person starts to swell like a balloon. And another common problem is that because the cervix is just near the bladder, uh, you find that the patient ends up developing pain when she's passing urine, and she may also start bleeding when she's passing urine. Another sign of advanced cancer of the cervix is that uh, the, the bleeding may become much, much worse. And uh, alongside the bleeding is a tendency to develop infections of the vagina and those infections tend to become severe enough for the woman to even start passing pus. So it actually gets really, really bad. And uh, as the, the tumor develops and consumes the tissues, it might even cause the, the vagina to be unable to facilitate intercourse. So you find that the vagina ends up looking like it's closed up. It's a closed up space because of the cancer. In 2018, the government of Kenya launched uh, the human papilloma vaccine and uh, the target was to give it to around 80,000 plus girls who are 10 years and below. Uh, the uptake of that was, it was pretty well received and it subsequently became a policy that now the human papilloma virus vaccine is now readily available in a lot of facilities. We have two types of vaccines, the cervical vaccine to prevent the cervix, the cervical cancer. We have the, the Gardasil and we have the Cervarix vaccine. The difference between the two vaccines is for Gardasil vaccine it has 12 strains and for Cervarix it has 9 strains and it is cheaper for any common monanchi who can be able to pay for it. So there's some age group that you're supposed to give for this vaccine. One, you start at 9 years. From 9 years to 26 years of age, you can be able to be given the vaccine. That person is 
is already prevented from that cervical cancer. From 26 years old going ahead, you can't be given the cervix vaccine, and this is because we assume from 20, from the 20 age, this person has been sexually active. So if you give the cervix vaccine, it is not going to, it's not going to protect this patient. Because one, already this patient might have the HPV viral. So if you give this person the cervix vaccine, it is going to now, it's like it is breaking up the, the virus that this person had, and it will be a real now cancer of the cervix. So we don't normally urge from 26 years old of age to get the vaccine. Those who people, those people who are at risk of catching and or developing cancer of the cervix, typically tend to be those who, one, have started having sex when they are very young. I think a classic example would be the thousands of teenagers who have turned pregnant. Remember, not every teenager who was having sex conceived. For the many thousands that actually turned pregnant, there are probably at least five to ten times more the, that number of teenagers who have been having sex but did not happen to get pregnant. So if someone starts off having sex very early, the context is that the person is either being violated or even if the person is having sex with someone who is around their age, then the relationship is not a committed one. So the tendency will be for that flimsy relationship to break. And when that relationship breaks, this is a person who has now become used to having sex. So they'll end up having sex with someone else. So starting off very early in an unstable relationship will mean that they'll tend to have a much higher number of sexual partners. And of course, within that context, where teenagers and young children are starting to have sex when they're young, uh, sex doesn't go alone. It tends to go with alcoholism, it tends to go with drugs, and tends to go with another very high risk factor called smoking. Because smoking increases the risk of virtually every cancer that is known to man. Then uh, the other thing is uh, on top of having uh, sex with multiple partners, is also having a partner who has been having sex with multiple partners. Another significant risk factor is developing repeated and persistent sexually transmitted infections. So uh, one of the things that puts uh, one at risk for developing these infections more frequently includes uh, the more common practices that uh, previously were not very well known, uh, but Western influence has introduced a lot of sexual practices that we are not particularly used to. And uh, one of the more common ones being oral sex. Because the human papilloma virus will be transmissible not only through uh, penovaginal intercourse, where the, there is the penis and the vagina coming into contact in sex, but also from mouth to genitals. And that is also a significant risk factor. Then thereafter, uh, having a male partner for a woman, if she, has, if she has a male partner who has had another female partner who has had cancer of the cervix or has active infection, then they are also at risk. Another significant risk factor is developing uh, diseases that suppress the immune system. And the most significant ones in this context of ours are the human immunodeficiency virus, which is responsible for AIDS because that shuts down the immune system. And another one that is very significant in our setting is the upsurge of diabetes. And one of the biggest risk factors for diabetes is obesity. So being obese and developing diabetes means there is a significant risk of developing uh, vaginal infections and being more susceptible to having more severe forms of it and having difficulties in clearing them when they arise. So when those factors all come together, you find that the average age at which a person will develop cancer of the cervix will come down significantly. Because previously people used to get married and they used to be in one stable relationship. And when they're in that one stable relationship that is intended to last for life, then the probability of developing these diseases is very low. But now we have got uh, a lot of what you call sexual mobility, where people are feeling that uh, 
they've become very empowered courtesy of the Western traditions uh, and the Western culture having come and taken over in our setting. So you find a lot of people uh, moving around and, uh, and that doesn't even spare the marital relationship. I think you heard somewhere along the way about people who even go swinging in marital relationships and uh, others who go and have multiple other sexual partners even within the context of marriage. Previously marriage was one of the protective factors but uh, uh, within the context of uh, functional monogamy. But now people have developed what is called serial monogamy where you are in a relationship, you are having sex with that one person but as soon as that relationship ends you get another person, have sex with that one and because the relationship is not stable on and on and on and on it goes. So it, the, the risks go compounding and along the way the tendency will be that somewhere along the line there is likely to be somebody who has an active uh, human papilloma virus infection. So what we normally do with this patient who comes at 26 years of age and we can't give the cervix, the the, the cervix vaccine, we normally do the pap smear, which is done yearly. Then if the results come out negative, then this patient is advised either to use a condom if you're not married, or you can, yeah, you have at least one partner. And then again, that annually of coming to be checked for cervical cancer through the screenings. Like nowadays in this era that you are having, most of the kids at nine years, they know more about sex. So it is not like every person who will come at nine years, you are going to give the vaccine. So we normally, we normally take them to, to the gynecology and then the gynecology will take up through the patient, again with the parent, they will talk through. And then sometimes this kid will be able to talk, will be able to be truthful to this gyna to tell the truth whether this person has indulged him or herself to do sex. So if he's sexually active, then you have to do the pap smear and then it will tell us the results and then you can go ahead by giving this vaccine. The vaccine also can be given to male. This is because male, they are also carriers. The male will not be able to get the cervical cancer because they don't have the cervix, but they can carry it to their partners. So we normally give it at least to reduce, to reduce the, the contact with the cervical cancer, which is, which is very helpful. But for men, we add them to do the Gardasil, which, which has the 12 strains because it's more, it's, more, it's more accurate and it is more effective than the, than the Savarix vaccine, which has nine strains. We want these young girls, before they start getting sexually active, to get access to this vaccine, to get the necessary education to understand why the vaccine is important, and to understand that the vaccine is a prevention measure because prevention is better than cure.